It is 401, calling the meeting of the way to select board to order for board of business. We're reviewing meeting minutes from the meeting of June 28th, which was the dog hearing, and from July 11th. Any comments on either set of minutes? No comments from me. No. no. Yeah, me neither. Okay, I'll move to approve both sets of minutes from the two meetings. Second. All in favor, Julie? Yes. Me, yes. Vendor and payroll warrants, any comments? No comments. None from me either. No. Comments from the public on items not on the agenda? Anyone have any comments for something not on the agenda? No. No scheduled appointments. COVID rapid tests are still available. Uh, what item are you here for? Just uh, about the uh, Goldberg. That is for Christian Lane. Okay. Uh, then why don't we deal with that first? It's on under chemistry. Okay. So. Oh, okay. So yeah. Okay, why don't we do I just let's deal with the items related to the people who are here first and then we'll go back in order. So okay, Brian, if you can go out of order and give us an update on that. So yep. Um so it's Jeff Cocott, uh 134 Christian Lane. Yeah. Uh, that's the property um to the south side of Christian Lane that um he has his house and barn, and then um, next to that is uh, the solar uh, the solar array. In front of that's a small field. In between the array and the house is a a drainage ditch that I've come to learn drains a lot of the property to the south of of Christian Lane and to the really back up to the railroad tracks. And I've also learned that there's a there's really another drain instead of drainage ditches and in pipes on the north side of Christian Lane that sort of all meet closer to Christian Lane and they all daylight out um, closer to the intersection of Long Plain Road and Christian Lane. And um, from what I what I've learned about the history of the, the system is that it was it was really a cooperative effort from a lot of the farmers that that lived there probably back to the 40s, maybe, 40s, 50s, 60s, yeah. moving forward uh, to help drain really that whole area of town. Uh, it's, it's obviously very flat there, so there's not a lot of, a lot of there's not a lot of elevation change where, and, and where water can go. Um, and I guess it's, how long has the system's been working up until, how long do you think? Uh, it's been quite a few years. I was in the service back in the 80s, and the town went through and put a new water line in back in the 86, if I'm correct, that summer, because the Marilat moved in, so they needed more, you know, more volume and such and whatever. So they accommodated Marilat for that project. So I feel that the contractor, whoever did it back in 86, might have, this is one of my assumptions, could have hit the dug up part of the drainage line, had no clue what it was, and just put stone in it, buried it, and called it good. Yeah. Because I remember prior to that, growing up, because that used to be my grandfather's place and such, the water always drained, not a problem. Get a big rainstorm, boom, yep, it drained. Ever since then, things backed up a little bit, but then, you know, the water went down. Um, Plus, well, also back in the 90s, they also did the town also probably had a contract to go through. We did some more uh, water line on the other side of the street, also, I believe, back in the early 90s, 90, 91, 92, somewhere around there. But uh, back to 86, uh, I, when they went through on my side, that's what I feel. Also, the pipe is an old steel corrugated pipe. Uh, how long does steel corrugated pipe take on water and hold water after all these years since the 40s? It rusts and it deteriorates. It's gone. I feel that pipe needs to be replaced. 
And also there's no drainage on Christian Lane from Maryland, well now Yankee Candle, at the railroad tracks, because in front of Yankee Candle, there's three drains there. And then over the railroad tracks, there's nothing until you get down to around the intersection or past the intersection by the cemetery, somewhere in that area, there's another drain, but also there's a drain right across from Scott and Wayne Nikoski's farm, but that's set off the road a little bit. Yeah, and, but, and from what, uh, I think from what Wayne told me that, that drain there connects into the system, right? I believe that connects in somewhere, yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's all, it's all, all a puzzle from way back when. And I'm sure a lot of it is not on the maps that the town has. Yeah, I've done some research and some deed research, and there's no recorded easements on any of the properties that the pipes pass, that, that the pipes supposedly pass under. The pipes that we know exist, that, that I've seen, there's right. no recorded easements on right. any of the on any of the, the documents. So um it's it's our understanding that at the point where um, where the drainage ditch ends on Mr. Cocott's property, where, where it comes to Christian Lane and passes under Christian Lane, the water's not getting past. That seems to be closer to where the problem is. Right. Um, and I noticed with this last rainstorm, all the water, a lot of it was running down Christian Lane. I'm watching it go down the property, and it's just finally eventually goes down right in that area. I mean, it was like a river the other day. I was watching it. Yeah, you said this is a, a system that was put in, that wasn't put in by the town, it was put in by a, a group of the farmers and the, the farmers. The, the farmers in the town got together and, yeah, okay, let's do it so they can make a living. The farmers needed to make a living back then, so that's what they did. When we say the town, did the, the town contribute money to this or? Back in the 40s, you tell me what they did. A handshake and how many pigs and chickens do you need? <laughs> Brian, is there any no. record of the town having any? Oh, we have not own ownership interest in this. Uh, we have not gone through all of the. Uh, we have not researched like the town meeting minutes or anything like that. Back that long. Um, no, I. I think we should, as a town, we should certainly look into anything that is either town owned or town administered. You know, for instance, the runs under the system runs under a Christian lane to see if a blockage on in that section owned by the town. Yeah, take a camera. And see yeah, what if we can take a camera and see Absolutely. see what that is. But unless we can show that the town. Is a part owner of this system going back forty to eighty years. Um, this, and you know, we'll try to take care of our portion. You know, that, that section under Christian Lane. Aside from that, as far as I know, this is not a town problem because it's not a town system. That it was apparently installed and maintained for a long time by that group of landowners right which it, all are pretty much gone or deceased at this time well the, the land is still there and it's exactly it's still so we have a new newer generation a pipe exists and it's a 12 inch pipe i mean i'm sure it's uh either eight blocked or i'm sure it's pretty much deteriorated yeah i'm but, sure some of it's probably even uh um clay Clay Kyle. But again, if it's not, if it was not installed or paid for in any way by the town, then mm -hmm. unfortunately it's not a town problem. It's not something that the town will, should come in and pay to rehabilitate or uh, or fix up. No. As I said, I'm, I think we'd be willing to see if that section under Christian Lane is a problem because that's a town thoroughfare and if it's under is there an easement under Christian name but it, it's there so it's a de facto easement um I, I suspect it was well, I'll, I'll 
for a while, I guess I would imagine it was known and allowed by the town for this to happen. Right. Um, I don't think you just go under a street without anything. But, uh, uh, unless I, you, I totally unless, unless I totally understand what you're saying, sir. Okay. I, I so, totally you know, we're, we're, I would like to see us do what we can, but what we can is very limited in this case to this, you know, to the section that's owned by the town. And if we, you know, if we can get a, uh, you know, a camera to run through the culvert, just, you know, to pipe at that point that runs under Christian Lane, see if there's town responsibility for any of it, then if there is, we'll go from there. If there isn't, not much else we can do. Because right now it's destroying my property, but it's going. I, uh, I sympathize, but it, it, it's it's just not a town problem because it's not a town owned facility. I mean, <laughs> certainly. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry, uh, Julie Joyce, any comments? Yeah, sorry. Question. Um, Mr. Cocott, can you clarify again for me? Yeah. You spoke up front, and I'm just catching up with all of this information. Talk to me about the water pipe that was put in. Who was that put in for, and when? That, uh, you, that you said you thought it was possible that the contractor had opened up what was a culvert and then hadn't known what it was and had maybe filled it with right stone. Back in 1986, when Marilat moved into town, they needed more volume of water. So the town agreed to, uh, in which Marilat, I believe, paid for pretty much all the project or the whole thing. Um, so they put in a new pipeline, water line, on the street back in 86 and i feel probably it's one of my i feel the contractor could have pretty much dug it up and oops what, what's this go to nobody's got any record of it said well okay cut it off where, where he broke it where, he, where the machine broke it and all they did is just build it in with stone because there was water there all the time so they couldn't fill it in with dirt, so they just used stone and just carried on. Okay, right. So this is conjecture, but that's possible that that's what happened. Yeah. Okay, so does the ownership of that water pipe pass to Yankee Candle now that Marilat's not there? Yes, that's all underground. That goes right to uh, uh, Yankee Candle. Who owns it? Does anybody on the board know? I don't know. But the pipe? Yeah. I, the, I, the I, I don't get your question. The town would own the pipe. The water department would be in charge mm -hmm. of the pipe. Oh, there you go. Okay. So that would be a query I would have too, is like in the variety of places that we think there might be a problem, including where there was some new construction done for a new water pipe. Does the town, it, does that go under Christian Lane or is that someplace different than we're talking about, Fred? It's on your side, right? Yeah, it's on, it's on the south side. It runs yeah. very well to the road. Right. Okay. So it may or may not run under Christian Lane, but that might be a portion of what the problem was. At this point, we're just sort of guessing what the problem is. But I would say looking into what it might be would be advantageous both for the property owner and for the town because we have a town road that runs right alongside it. It's going to be very hard to attribute responsibility to a contractor 37 years ago. Yes, I don't know that we can go back and get damages from the contractor, but we, you know, might be able to say, okay, that's on town property or that's not on town property or gee, that's what the problem is. And you know, I, I, none of none of this is on town property that we're talking about. It's all it may be on town owned and water All right. pipe. So what, yeah what i'm what i mean then i guess but it's is, running through. Yeah, is the pipe owned through. by the town yeah yeah joyce did you have a comment um i guess i i think i i feel like we need more information um and uh, uh you know at what point does a 
problem like that become a town issue and not a private property owner's issue is something I don't really know where that line is. Um, yeah. And uh, that I sort of feel like more information would be good. So if we can do, um, you know, at least some minimal amount of research on this, I think that might be a good first step. Yeah, I, yeah. Unfortunately, I think that we we know that the system is paid was paid for and installed privately. It was. Oh yeah, you know, I I understand all that, but yeah. you know, at some point when when like if the road were flooding, that would be a town issue. Is my understanding is the road is not flooding. It's just that drainage in that part of town when there's really heavy rains is a problem for the people who live there. You know, and uh, Mr. Cocut, chief among them. Um, and at what point does taking control of that drainage fall on the town or the property owner? That I don't know. That's so I, I guess that's something where um, more information would be helpful. Mm -hmm. And it could be a combination of the town and the property owner. Um, no, I, I, I just I agree, but I, I, we need to find out. Yeah, we need more information. Going going back into the eighties, was there any town country? Does the town own any part of that system, really? Mm -hmm. um, or or does it not? Because you know, in spite of the the you know, threat and heavy rain, such as getting to Christian Lane, right. it's not. You know, we have to know, is, is there any town responsibility for that as opposed to just seeing a potential problem, you know, over the, you know, coming onto the road. Mm -hmm. So, Brian, we can try to find out if there's, if there's ever any town investment in this, and which may mean going back to the minutes of the meetings in the 80s. Oh, it's likely before that. It's like in the forties, right? When it went in, right? It, so, I mean, the way I conceptualize it is, there might be a short-term fix, and then there there might be a longer-term solution that's going to need to be found. One would be, hey, it's blocked. Some it's blocked somewhere in the town right away. If we can unplug it, connect it back into the the system, and it'll work in the short term. But in longer term, what I was going to say before was. You know, if we can do a little bit of research, maybe myself or Sylvie, in terms of what grants or, or you know, what's out there in terms of supporting agriculture, um, in terms of, you know, dealing with this water and um, dealing with flooding. And that's a topic on everybody's mind recently. Because um, honestly, if, if, if this system wasn't in, there would probably be a lot more fields underwater right now. Right. Um, so, you know, yeah, into Joyce's point, at, at what time, at, at what size does the problem get so big that it that it is a community problem? Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, if we could do some sort of investigation in the town right away, I think that would be good. We'll do some well, some research in the town records to see if, if we have any record of when that happened, and then maybe um, you know keep our eyes open when we're looking for grants and things like that as to whether there might be funding to address, you know, this issue, maybe something related to climate change or resiliency or, you know, agriculture and resiliency and sustainability, stuff like that. So that's, those are my thoughts. So those are really three, three different things, I guess. Okay. So I think we just have to go back and yeah. do some more yeah. study as to exactly what the nature of the, I'm trying to rent the, the that field out and, I can't, and not really. And Mr. Uh, uh, let's see, Scott Pekoski, uh planted stuff uh, there, and that's all underwater. Uh, he's got a lot of, you know, time and effort and money spent there. And, huh. and okay. there's but, no oh, drain yeah. on the street whatsoever. And I just watched it run down the road the other night. So, mm. so ultimately, we, we have to find out. Know, is, is this? Something the town should have any responsibility 
Well, I just want to let you know, you know I'm a taxpayer in town here, and something needs to get done. I invest into this town, and I also have solar on the property, which I'm concerned about with the water issue being like that, with you know, all that voltage and all that too. Understood. But the question is, I, I, is, is it legally a town problem or not? And we'll try to try to get to the bottom of that. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I think we'll call to the top of the agenda the a letter from Paul and Taya regarding the use and availability of the fire department command vehicle. Brian, do you have that letter? Can you read it? You got it right on top there. Yes. <clears throat> Um, letter, uh, email from Paul and Taya. Uh, when the Whitley Finance Committee recommended the purchase of a fire department command vehicle, it was for quote unquote safety reasons. As Chief Hannum explained at FinCom meetings, the need for a command vehicle was to help coordinate activity at a fire or any other disaster responded to by, by our fire department. More specifically, it aided calls to the local highways. Um, it had calls to the local highways by the Whitley Fire Department, as its presence could not be mistaken as a civilian vehicle and its communications capability allowed for immediate engagement with other departments. The Whitley Fire Department command vehicle should be available 24-7 in order to be used in the role it was originally purchased. I remember a discussion that this vehicle was not being provided to the Whitley Fire Department solely as a means of transportation for the fire chief, but for any first responder to a disaster. We were fortunate that Chief Hannon lives close to the station and available 24-7. Please pass this along to the select board to collect their thoughts on this topic. Uh, uh, Fire Chief J.P. Kennedy, you want to sort of give us an idea of how sure, this yeah. vehicle is being used? Or Yeah, I'd be happy to speak to that point a little bit. Um, the, the vehicle has been used for a lot of purposes. Um, the, First and foremost, and the most obvious thing that people are going to see is, is uh, they're going to see the, the vehicle at the fire station when I'm working at the fire station. Uh, last few weeks, done a lot of work um, doing um, some things inside the station in the office, trying to set up an office and doing some cleanup stuff and preparing to, to set up a more permanent office in there. Um, but the vehicle has also been used on several emergencies. You know, we've had a uh, search in West Waitley. I was able to respond to. Um, we had a major incident in Conway. I'm sure you're aware of um, vehicles on the road for uh, probably uh, eight hours um, during that emergency. We were able to deploy it and get lots of places where we couldn't get fire trucks. Um, and as early as yesterday morning, um, I was. Uh, Oh, way back up a little bit. The um, as, there, as recent as this morning, um, I was able to uh, do an inspection over Yankee Candle. I spent two and a half hours over there um, with a safety officer there, and um, I think it's important for the public to see the vehicle out. It's recognizable as an emergency vehicle. Um, we do have a defibrillator in there. We do carry an Arcan in there. It's readily available. <laughs> Um, I think it's an asset that's um, best used when there's somebody in it on the road. The vehicle is certainly available for people. Um, in the past, we talked about having a vehicle available if somebody wanted to do a class or travel out of town or something like that for um, training. And the vehicle will, is certainly available for that for our department members if need be. Um, and certainly when I'm not in town, like if I'm going to be gone in September for a week, uh, the vehicle will be at the fire station. It'll be available for for people to use um, there as well. Okay, so does that answer your question? Well, yeah, as far as what is the user. All right. On a regular basis, generally, it is stored or garaged or whatever at at my house at your house. Um, so e either you would have to get you know for someone else, or if you're in Amherst, you know, someone and there's a call. Yeah, here someone would have to either go to your house to get it or not. Correct, or would not be used. And you know, historically, it 
hasn't been used for that very much. Um, I know that I have used the vehicle uh, two or three times since it was new to travel out east to fire prevention classes, um, just to save wear and tear on my personal vehicle. Um, since I was giving up my time for the town, I figured I, I could take a, a town vehicle for transportation. Um, but um, I don't know that it has been utilized by fire department members very much outside of that. Is that, I don't have any that. well, it, you know, because I mean, you don't have any knowledge, you wouldn't know if that's because it is not accessible or it is not needed. You know, I think right now there's there's not a, a big need for it right now. Um, I think our our staffing numbers are such that if we have four people, they're going to be on a piece of fire apparatus mm -hmm. um, responding on the engine. That's what we like to have is four people responding. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes if need be, we'll respond with three. Um, you know, it's not like right now we have 15 people responding to a majority of our calls. So, is there any indication it would get greater usage if it were to be stored at the fire department. I think it would certainly be used a lot less if it was stored at the fire station. Yeah. It would be used less if you... Correct. Okay. Yeah. So essentially, the, the chief is the primary Correct. user of this of Correct. vehicle. And you know, across the board in other communities, that's generally... I don't know of any other communities where... Um, there's a full time or 20 hour position, you know, or, or similar, you know, uh, our part time position chief where the vehicle is stored at the, at the station. Um, generally, the, the vehicle is stored someplace where it's most readily deployed if, if there's an emergency. Okay. Therefore, I think, you know, as, as the department chief, I think that's where it's best utilized is uh, with, the, with the chief. Okay. And, uh, Julie, Joyce, any comments or questions? Um, they're, they're in my backpack, if you're looking. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is this is all new territory for me. Uh, you know, in initial discussion, I'm inclined to say it should be parked at the fire station and be available to all of the personnel of the fire station and not necessarily specifically attached to the chief. But I don't know practices in other towns around this. So I'm taking a moment to look that up and I'm going to hold judgment for a few okay. minutes. Joyce? So who, who would be um, using the. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go, you, go, you go ahead. Well, my, my question would be who, who would be using it more if it was at the fire station? Not necessarily more, but just that it would be available if somebody else on the fire department needed it you're the you're the person who works most hours is right. that so and you live in conway about a mile over the town line conway okay all right so theoretically if there was an emergency and you needed that vehicle you'd have to drive from conway to the fire station in waitley to get that vehicle is that what you're right. saying that it makes more sense for you to have it Yes, and you know, communication is another issue where um, we have a lot of parts of town in West Whaley where our portable radios don't work and our mobile radios do work. Yeah. Um, you know, a case in point is um, Haydenville Road in the area where we had the search um, just a few days ago. Um, it was a good asset to have on scene there, and we held our, you know, our um, fire truck and our search parties at the station. Um, yeah. And um, we did not end up deploying them, but we had a command post set up, um, Chief Sabine and I did, um, and that's where it was best utilized, was there at the command post with a, um, a good mobile radio. Are you aware when under, when Chief Hannum was in charge, I know he, he would have the vehicle at his house. Correct. Are you aware of that there were ever any issues with that, that there were any problems that people wanted access to it that they were not able to, not to, I, not to get be, because it was not at the fire station. Yeah, no, not at all. Joyce, Senator. Yeah, 
Well, um, I um, the main thing that yeah you know, that I'm thinking like um, the vehicle is generally with the chief in some way or another, but um, there are times when you're not in either Waitley or Conway, and I think those might be um, the ones that are probably more concerning, right? There's times when you're at your other job in Amherst. There's you know, times when you might be, I don't know, on vacation. Um, mm -hmm. uh, times when you might be just away for the weekend or something like that. Um, it might be that we we need to find a good solution to that. Because if that vehicle is needed in a situation when you're, you don't happen to be around for very good reasons, right? <laughs> Everybody does need to get away. Uh, we hired you knowing you have a job in Amherst. And, um, you know, that it, it seems like you, I'm not saying we don't need this vehicle or that we, um, uh, that it's not primarily something that the chief is going to be um, using. But I think there might be some situations in which it would be good to. Um, I don't know, custody isn't really the right word, but sort of have custody of that um, vehicle turned over when uh, when it's clear that you can't use it for an emergency in Whaley. Mm -hmm. I, I just Does that make one, sense? It, is that, does any of that make sense? I'm not sure if I it, was very clear. And I understand what you're, what you're saying, but I just think looking back historically, vehicles purchased in 2019, here we are in 2023. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I think I'm the only one who's ever used the vehicle other than the fire chief. Um, and it wasn't from lack of avail availability because as was right. stated in the letter, it's been parked in the center of town 24 seven. But I don't, I don't see its location as being an issue. And I think I can certainly accommodate somebody willing to use it for a class or something like that. Um, right. And right well, now I can't, I can't think of a time where a firefighter would necessarily need it um, in an emergency. We do have um, a mobile radio in the water department truck that Captain Mikoski is able to use. So he's able to utilize the radio aspect of it, uh -huh. um, of the vehicle. Um, and, um, you know, uh, Keith Bardwell also has a good radio as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't but, think, I don't know what the what the demand would be right now. Right, but the the previous chief didn't have a job two days a week in Amherst. Right, and maybe he never ever went away on vacation either. <laughs> but I mean, he, he did have other other jobs as well, right? I mean, he drove a bus and he ran a sugar house, and there was things that but, he couldn't. Leave, but right? he wasn't. The, but the the that vehicle wasn't a part of those jobs. It wasn't something that went with him to those jobs. So I'm that's my understanding. My, correct, but, it, but I'm not taking I'm not taking my job, my my vehicle out of town to work either, right? Yeah. Is yeah, that the but, Okay. So what would be what would be the thing that makes it hard to leave it in a place where others can get to it if they need it? Is it is it just like a call well, if I if if I if I um, I came back from work this morning, uh, for example, here's my 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 work today. Um, I left work in Amherst and I drove to Leverett in my personal vehicle and I met with the Leverett fire chief for an hour and a half to go over permitting um, and yeah. solar plant approvals and, and, and such. Um, and um, I drove from there back home because I had a meeting at Yankee Candle and picked up the fire department vehicle and was able to meet with him and- You picked it up from home? From home. Okay, Correct. all right. Yep. Um, and was able to spend the rest, the rest of the day with it. When I'm done, I'm gonna take it back home. Yeah, okay. Um, so there's still a certain amount of, of things between, you know, when if I'm passing through town, it's not like I'm, I'm refusing to do any, any business in my vehicle like I've done for the last um, no, 30 no, I, some odd years. Yeah. But um, if the vehicle's parked in town at the fire station, 
and we have a fire call in West Waitley or a fire call um, on Westbrook Road or on North Street. It or doesn't East really Waitley. make sense <laughs> for me to come to the fire station to pick up the vehicle and leave in a command vehicle after, presumably after the fire truck is now left and go. You know, the, the best way for that unit to be deployed is yeah. for it to be to be on the road. Um, no, I, I, I understand that, but that I, I agree that, you know, while you're um, basically responding to things, you're here, right? right. Um, then it makes perfect sense. But you already said when you when you go to Amherst, the vehicle's left behind at your home. And right. that's, I think, the concern we're hearing uh, specifically from our finance committee is that if the vehicle is at your home, and I know this only applies to two days a week. Um, you're saying that it tends not to be needed, but well, in the last that, in, in the last four years since a vehicle has been purchased, there hasn't been any complaints that I'm aware of from the fire department. Um, or any any let me back up. There have not been any members from the fire department other than myself using it. So I don't know where the sudden demand or need for other uses for the vehicle comes into play. I think it's just if, they, if there is an emergency while you are at your job or out of town for whatever reason, that having that vehicle available, if there is, what and it may be some, yeah, some kind of emergency, a situation that where that vehicle and or the equipment on it would be needed. I mean, that's the concern that, that I think um, they're trying to express. No, I, I, I understand I understand the, the argument. I'm just trying to clarify that I think having the vehicle at the fire station would decrease its availability, decrease its utilization, and decrease the availability of the emergency equipment on it. Um, if I'm doing inspections, if I'm out driving around to and from an inspection, I have, I'm immediately available to respond with the equipment on in, in the truck, right? I have Narcan, I have a defibrillator, we'll just right. go with the most easy ones to, to quantify in that. Um, I think that's an asset that's readily available to the town. And I think that much like a police car, if somebody sees a fire department vehicle, it's easily recognizable. And if there's an emergency, they can, they would flag me right. down and say that there was an emergency. Um, but when you're in Daytona Beach on spring break, okay, you're not going to be running back up here when there's an emergency. Okay, so when when you're like away for the weekend, right? Is it couldn't we park that car at the fire station for times when you're away? I, I mean, think, so. I, and, I and, think and that, that you know it's, it's a time when you would not respond. At times when you can respond, I have no problem. Right, I, I think but that times the logistics when you can't of me moving the vehicle every time I'm out of town for twenty four hours would preclude me from utilizing yeah. the vehicle. At that point, I would right. say, I'll park the vehicle at the fire station and simply utilize my truck for everything, in which case, yeah. I don't know, but yeah. there would probably right. be- a No, I, I don't mean out of town, meaning here. outside of Waitley. I, I mean, nearby, right? You can respond. Like if you're in a position where you can respond to something, then I think that that vehicle being with you is, is advantageous for all the reasons you said. If you're going I, I to Boston that, for the weekend, then the, the that's logistics a different thing. Vehicle every time I'm out of town is. With, I, I think maybe what we should sense. do is try to come up with a period of time. You know, if you're going to be out of town for a week or two weeks, right? Then thought, certainly, it, it should be at yeah. the station. I thought I clarified that in the beginning. Like, yeah. So in September, I'm going to be gone for a week, and that would certainly be a time where I would have the vehicle at the fire station available for people. Um, 
you know, there's okay. Good, think, good, because that's that's the kind of situation that I was actually thinking of. I was not thinking yeah, of. Yeah, I brought that up in the beginning. Okay. I think, oh. I think that historically, given the the utilization of the vehicle in the past, um, I think that if we insist on it being available to everybody twenty four seven, um, is you know every time I'm out of town, it doesn't really make sense given the history of the last four years of the utilization. I do agree that. Um, if I'm out of town for a week, I will certainly make it available and have it parked someplace where it's mm -hmm. available. Okay. And you know, there's a key at the fire station. If there was some extended event going on, and and um, I'm out of town for 24 hours, there's certainly people can can go and, and utilize the vehicle for whatever it needs to be used for. Um, or if there's some expect, unexpected yeah. unexpected travel, they can certainly. Use the vehicle for that. And okay. They would have to go to your home and get it, and then come back, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I I think maybe we should do a sit down outside of the meeting, just come up with a, a general guideline, and then probably something like you know, if you if you know you're going to be out of town for forty eight or maybe seventy two hours, then it should be yeah taken to the station. You know. Long, you know, two or three, you know, no, not 24 hours. No, not when you go to work. I, yeah, well, I'll, I'd be happy to sit down and yeah, talk okay. about that. I think, let me just clarify that surrounding towns typically that have fire department chief vehicles, um, they generally stay with the fire chief. So I think that, you know, me willing to, to accommodate the town by saying that it will be in you know the fire station if I'm gone for a week is very reasonable. There's other departments where if they're gone for a week it it, it stays at home. Um, there are other vehicles. We have a brush truck at the fire station which could be utilized in the same capacity right now as the pickup truck. Um, really no different. It's the pickup truck has seating for four people. The brush truck has seating for two, but they will go the same places and essentially serve the same functions, except that um, the only difference is right now the uh, pickup truck has a defibrillator in it, um, and at the fire station, our defibrillator is in the fire truck itself. Okay, I, I think we'll be able to, to reach some sort of accommodation on this. Uh, um, you know, just so long as it's available when you are not for an extended period. There's, I don't, okay, Julie? The, uh, I had just one question. Um, the thing that stuck out for me was you taking the truck east to workshops. Um, I might have a little bit more of a question about it, about it being used as a commuter vehicle, um, just to see, as you stated, to save wear and tear on your personal vehicle. Or Typically, okay. when I go to a workshop, I use my personal vehicle and I you know, I keep mileage and I get reimbursement for mileage. I don't know if there's a possibility for you to do that. That using the command vehicle as a commuter vehicle just stuck out to me as maybe. Well, so it's not really a commuter vehicle. It's going on. It's fire going department, on fire, fire department, department business. business. If, if I'm going in uniform, dressed, you know, representing the fire department, um, typically every other vehicle in the parking lot at a fire Massachusetts fire prevention meeting. Is a fire department vehicle. Okay. All righty. Um, and and it, there have been there have been many many times where I've driven in my own vehicle, and I've never put in for mileage for the town. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's it's asking that much really. Yeah, it's part, I, I think it's part I, of the I job. would think that going to it's part of the going job. someplace on fire department business would certainly be a qualified use for the vehicle. Okay, thanks. I wanted that clarified. Okay, no problem. Okay, so we will sit down at some okay. point. We'll do the certain chat at some point if I have things are going. So right. that'll, that'll be on me. I hope that answered yeah. some of the questions that are out there. Yeah. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, old business. Uh, review and discuss conditions of the liquor license, adult entertainment license, and variants in anticipation of the reopening of Club Castaways. 
the newly pink painted above castaways. Um, we it's have newly pink painted. I haven't driven by there recently. Yeah, yeah, you have to drive by the, the trim. Is, the pink trim pink. is all they painted the building white with pink trim. Mm, okay. And they had a brand new sign up on State Road. Um, okay, we've got two and a half pages of uh, regulations and conditions that were approved in 2018 when the license was transferred. Um, we need to, I guess, figure out who who is responsible for seeing those conditions and met whether it's a building inspector or the police chief or um it's certainly not um the building inspector. really the building inspector well, I, I i know that there was, at one point there was a built there was a, a fence um issue that he, yeah the there was a, whether the cement masonry block wall right. was supposed to connect to the, the the back fence the wood fence right. um and the wood fence got snow plowed one year and sort of after right. everything put back up um, so, uh, I've I've heard from their attorney that they're that they're hoping to reopen. Uh, they're planning on reopening. Um, we've all seen the the dumpster outside and the the improvements that are being made to the exterior of the building. And presumably, some some stuff is happening in the interior of the building. Um, but what I really wanted to, uh, to talk about was um, was the variance. So if some of us, some of us get to relive this, but after I think like six public hearings, um, the select board approved the the alcohol license and uh, the adult entertainment license, and then there was the issue of the the town's adult entertainment regulations that required a, a police detail on the premises every time there was alcohol served along with adult entertainment. And at that point, the applicants requested a variance um, from that um, from that regulation. And um, what the board had decided on granting was for a four month period. Let me just bring it up here. Um, for a four month period, um, they were going to allow. Uh, they were going to require a police detail on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights from 9.30 to 1.30 a.m. for a four-month period. Um, and there was to be um, monthly, it was essentially once a month, right? It was the second select board meeting of the month. Um, the select board was to receive a report from the owners about the operations of um, the establishment. And um there, there's a little bit more detail than that but that's um what, what i wanted to highlight so um they opened uh, the establishment opened on um according to our records opened on october 29th 2020 um so in hindsight i think it would have been better if we didn't do four months we did it a number of days or something like that but if we're saying four months, so October 29th. So if that's when they opened, the four month period would have ended on February 29th, 2021. Um, but we all know what, what happened is the club closed on January 15th, 2021. Um, those, those dates don't seem right. But sure it's not 2019 into 2020. I think that's what it is. 2019. It was October 29, 2019 right. into February 29, 2020, and they closed on January 15th of 2020. Right. Um, I was thinking about the COVID pandemic and how those numbers did right. how those years <laughs> didn't line up. Um, so if that's the math, if it's October 29th, um 2019 to January 15, 2020, there would be 45 days remaining out of that four month period. Um, and the conditions of the variance 
kids um, in terms of in terms of counting the number the days of that four month period, it did read excluding full days that the establishment is closed. Um, because I think the select board had a concern that um the the operations could close and then it would still count as as this time mm -hmm. uh, in operation. Um uh, the the rationale behind the select select board's decision at the time was that these were new owners um who were not experienced in operating a club that offers this type of entertainment. Um and it was to provide them the opportunity to show that um, they would be good owners and could run a a um, top of the line operation. Um, so my I, my question to the board is: um, assuming that I find out in the next week or so that they're going to operate, um, what would it like to do in terms of? the variance in the remaining amount of time. What is the remaining 45 minutes, 45 days called? That's not the variance, that's the... The term, maybe? Yeah, that was, that would be the, that there would is. be the, the time left. Yeah, yeah, but mm -hmm. it's not the it's not the variance, but the time left on the um, essentially a probationary period. Probationary period. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'd be in, I'd be in favor of the probationary period continuing for the remainder, just because we haven't seen any, you know, haven't seen since the end of COVID, or not the end of COVID, since the somewhat waning of COVID, we haven't seen what this looks like. And we'd like to know. Yeah, I, I, I don't see any reason we should suspend that. Um, yeah, we should keep the we should keep the variance as it is. I think. Are there other things that they have to do to open aside from our conditions? Are there other annual inspections, you know, fire department or other that? they will need to be sure to do before they reopen. Um what we I just talked with JP, we just yeah. talked with JP earlier. He he thinks that there should be an annual life safety inspection. Um mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Um if he has not done one. He was going to check with John to see if one had been done recently. I, I it, it's unlikely because they haven't been operating. Yeah it's been, it's been three and a half years since they've been operating. It's a question of are there any Annual inspections or annual requirements that have lapsed because they have not been operating for three and a half years. Right. In terms of the building itself, I um, JP will have a conversation with with okay. Jim Hawkins is, uh, about that, and obviously we'll have a conversation with with uh, Chief Savini to make sure that um, all the requirements that they have met. That they have met in the past or are still operational, right? There's a, there was a, uh, a security system that was put in mm -hmm. place, and it, it it's good for him to make sure those things still are, are still in play. Um, and obviously, he'll need to arrange for police details right. at those required times. So, um, but so the, the 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 board wants to continue with uh, essentially pick right back up where it left off. Right. I'm in yeah. um, when the, when it closed on January 15th. Yes, 2020. <laughs> right. Um, and if they uh, just essentially as a courtesy mostly to Jim Savini, you know, let us know when they intend to open so that he can get in beforehand and talk to them. Uh, yeah, and, uh, about the security system. Yeah, and they'll, they'll need to schedule police details well right. at the time. So. Right. Yep. And, and from I guess and from our standpoint, um, they we, we would need um, proof of liquor liability insurance before they would be allowed to open. And mm -hmm. um, well, also, I think we need to understand that this was done in 2018 before, or just as cannabis was starting to come in that 
cannabis smoking on premises is not permitted under under the cannabis laws. That would qualify as smoking as any other, which means designated because the place is outside the building for smoking of anything. Right. Have they jettisoned the idea to open it as a cannabis dispensary? I believe so, but I don't quote me on that. Yep. I mean, it looks this way because they're trying to open as is. At least in the short term, I think, yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. We've, had, we've, we've had no further notification that they're pursuing yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. My understanding is the regulations for, for social consumption are still in the works with yeah. the Cannabis Control Commission. So mm -hmm. I think it'll be a little while. Okay. Any other comments on this? Good. I just have one, if yeah, that's sure. okay. Um, yep. I remember last, when they first opened up, they were basically not in compliance with the with the variants for quite some time. And we mm. had to close them down in order to get them to comply. Um, is there... <clears throat> I mean, I know there's a, there's a number of things in the variants related to security, to cameras, to access to those cameras. Um, that is, is that on some, like Jim Savini's checklist to uh, to be sure that those things are being complied with, and with the idea that they cannot open if they're not in compliance. And I don't know what like what the mechanism would be for you know they they open when they're out of compliance and basically we we're the licensing board we have the responsibility to take action then is that right it sounds to me like the variance it looks like it's simply about having a police presence at certain times and making sure that they are doing what they said they were going to do the license is granted contingent upon the lessee doing uh, the owner doing at 60 days after the issuance of the license doing video surveillance ceiling and light fixtures a wall yeah. and all that stuff and we can shut them but, down if they yeah. don't comply with any of that right but it's been 60 days though so 60 days has already passed they've so opened that, oh and yeah and they and well yeah they since they first opened got it um yeah and they so I was, I'm scrolling through. I just I had that variance up here in front of me a little while ago, and I I, yeah, I believe the issue scrolling. was they uh, did not construct the uh, masonry wall around the the rear smoking area, and the board allowed them to to open without that being constructed, uh, and they prom promised or said that they weren't going to use the rear smoking area. Um, and the board allowed them to open, and then it was past the 60 days, and then I think it might have been another 90 days, and it still wasn't being constructed, so the board yeah. said they needed to do it before they could reopen right. again. So will that still stand in place, that they need to construct that before we'll say go ahead and reopen? I, I believe it's been done. It's been done, I think, it's at this done. point. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But there was that period of time where there was that issue. Yeah. So Joyce, are you asking? No, I was just trying kind of rem reminding us in a way and, and myself that, you know, as the licensing board, it's sort of in, in some sense, it's our job to mm -hmm. enforce that. Like if, if we find out that things in this variance are not actually happening, then we need to, you know, call them in, and and it's on us. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in the we, sense that we don't that, have a code enforcement officer, which would, in another municipality, might be the person who would do that. Yeah, we. That's right. It's so it's kind of on us. And I guess uh, Jim, being the person who's going to have the the most close contact with them, um, uh, would be in some sense our eyes and ears on that. Um, so anyhow, I just kind of wanted to remember, uh, kind of speak through that so that I was remembering it correctly and, and understanding it correctly. 
Okay, but we're good with making no changes to the probationary right. period and having it continue from whenever they reopen. Yep. Now. Yep. Okay. And on to new business. Uh, to discuss and vote whether to award the contract for a complete streets funded projects. Brian, we have a contract. We do. In our practice. Um, I sent it uh, this morning when I got it from Brokaw. I sent it separately. Um, so yeah. I'm trying to find it here. I at least can find the the big tabulation and turn that up. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, and there was a separate contract that was emailed out. Uh, let me just. So this is the um, complete streets project that we've had to grant for. It's it's been a while. I think we've had to grant for about a year and a half, and there wasn't a lot of traction um on it but um here we are so the project's been out to bid this is uh, the second complete streets uh construction project by the town the first one uh paid for the the installation of the new sidewalks uh, along chestnut plain road and uh this the second project will complete uh, the installation of sidewalks from the veterans memorial um essentially to the church and it will connect up the loop um to the congregational church it will connect that walking loop so that'll be on the east side of chestnut plain yeah they'll know the sidewalk yep um then there's there's two um intersection realignment projects one uh at uh williamsburg road and conway road and then the other one at conway road and weber road it's just trying to um uh tee up those intersections a little bit better to get some to get some angles uh, uh, that are more favorable to people slowing down and or stopping before uh, proceeding to those intersections. And then the last part um, is to extend the um, sidewalk at the Whitley, Whitley Elementary School from its um, existing termination about um, less than halfway up the driveway all the way to uh, Long Plain Road. So that if kids are needing to go up or down that driveway, that they can do it safely on the sidewalk. Um, one of the concerns that was uh, that was addressed, that was told to us in the design process, was that um, a lot of parents line up their uh, pick up their children at the elementary school, to pick up or drop them off. Um, so they don't want to lose that pull off area um, for those cars to, to to pull to the side. So that's that's being taken care of and it's actually being improved because prior to this the the pull off uh, people were pulling off onto the onto the dirt shoulder and it was starting to um erode away the shoulder and the dirt and mm -hmm. uh, crack the pavement so um so the project was put out to bid um taylor davis landscaping and construction out of amherst was the low bidder um by far um taylor davis did the original uh, installation of the uh, the sidewalks in the center of town. We thought they did a, a good job. They also did the landscaping for the, the, the town hall project um, in the parking lot there. Um, so we thought that they did well with those two projects. So uh, the recommendation uh, to the board is that they would award the, the contract to Taylor Davis. Okay. Um... I understand the total amount of the grant is 164,000 roughly. So yes. a small contingency in there, but it, if we get overruns, we're gonna have to find the town will have to come up with money to to finance those. Yeah. And all of the project, well, um, some of the uh, two portions of the project would be chapter 90 eligible so that's a that's a possibility if they're you know slight overruns yeah. the project itself there's not there's not really any hitting conditions that we're too worried about um like there could be in some other projects because we're not really excavating you know very much so um it's, i would also think that you know, if it's a small amount and 
Chapter 9 funds are not eligible for whatever reason, then we could also go into CLF borrow money for that. <clears throat> I hope we don't have an overrun and we can get it done for the 156,000, but yeah, we have to be prepared to, yeah. to cover overruns. Any questions or comments on this? No, nope. not for me. Do I get a I have a motion. To... I move that we approve Taylor Davis Landscaping and Construction, that we sign the contract with them for the um, amount described. I second. All in favor? Julie? Aye. Me? Yes. Next, uh, review, discuss, and vote whether to sign the covenant between the town and Quan Quan Farm for the CPA grant for the historic silo preservation. Uh, restoration project. This was approved at town meeting. Yeah. Um, so we have the backing of the town to do this. Brian, any other comments? Um, yeah. So this was the this was the the article to for uh, CPA grant to Quan Quan Farms in the amount of. Twenty-seven thousand three hundred fifty dollars, I believe. Um, you have twenty-seven thousand three hundred fifty dollars, um, and it's been a practice of the the CPC to require a grant agreement and a, a deed covenant that would require the repayment of the of uh, the CPA funds. Where um, in this case, where the where the historic silos aren't maintained in accordance with the uh, uh, Secretary of Interior's uh, standards for historic historic buildings and structures um, for a twenty year period. So um, that's what the grant agreement requires, and that's also what the covenant requires. Um, and the recording of the covenant will it it puts uh, future purchasers on notice um, that 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 obligation would apply to them because the covenant will run with the land. Um, and the grant agreement and the covenant would require would require the repayment of the money to the town in full if um, the historic silos were sold to an ineligible buyer or they weren't maintained in accordance with the with the Secretary of Interior standards. Um, that's it's it's similar to what was required of the Congregational Church when that money was granted to the church for the, the historic window restoration. Okay. Any comments, questions? Nope. Sounds good. And I will move. We approve the covenant between the town and Quan Quan Farm for its CPA grant. Second. All in favor, Julie? Yes. Me? Yes. I think it's been done. Uh, to review, discuss, and vote to sign a memorandum of understanding with the Franklin County Solid Waste Management District for household hazardous waste collections and the required third party inspections. Yes. Um, so there's there's two uh, MOUs here. One is, and I'm just gonna repeat what Fred said, but um, the town's required to have a third party inspect its transfer station um, under state law and mass DEP regulations. And then also uh, the Franklin, so the Franklin County Solid Waste Management District, which the town is a member of, has third party inspectors um, that will do that. Um, and the second part is the Franklin County Solid Waste Management District operates what's called household hazardous waste days. Um, and I believe that one, um, September 23rd, I believe. Uh, they're having so it's it's a once a year event. Um, September twenty third, twenty twenty three. There's two sites. One is at Greenfield Community College. The other one is at the Orange Transfer Station. So uh, residents can bring um, and drop off for recycle or disposal household hazardous wastes um, free of charge. The town annually allocates uh, a budget for this. Uh, this year it's twelve hundred dollars. That's in line with what. Expenses have been, uh, you know, from residents in Waitley in the past. Um, 
So that's what this uh, MOU is. The, the town's essentially agreeing to, to pay for costs um, of the household hazardous waste that are that are dropped off. Um, the, the, the solid waste committee will tell you that it's better to do it this way than for people to dump it in the backyard or in their backwoods. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, we, we all know that it never happens, of course. Um, and I did just want to mention, I noticed when I was reviewing um, the MOU for the transfer station inspection, it says the MOU shall be effective through June 30, 2023. I believe that should be 2023. Because if it's 2023, then we're not accomplishing much no, here. But, okay, so that, that will have to be changed. Uh, okay, so we actually have two different things to approve here. Any questions or comments? None. Uh, I will move. We approve the memorandum of understanding between Franklin County Solid Waste Management District and the Town of Waitley regarding third party inspection of the transfer station. Second. All in favor, Julie? Yes. Me? Yes. Do I have a motion on the uh, second memorandum of understanding regarding solid, uh, hazardous waste day? Uh, yes, with the amendment of item 11 to June 30th, 2024. I, I move that we approve that. Second. All in favor? Julie? Yes. Me? Yes. Uh, next item, considering the appointment of George Colt as library trustee to fill the vacancy created by the failure to elect at the previous election. If I understand correctly, we have a essentially combined vote of the tr library trustees and the select board. Has the have the library trustees voted already? Yeah, and they have approved George Cole. <laughs> Essentially, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've got more people to vote than we could say. But yes. Uh, so you can vote your vote your heart out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions, comments? No. I move we appoint George Colt as a library trustee. Second. I mean, yes, second. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, all in favor, Julie? Yes. Me, yes. Uh, next I item. Think I did not highly qualified authors into all of the yeah. positions where we have right. failed to elect. Yep, yep. George Colt is a good man. Yep. Yeah. Congratulations, Mr. Cole. Enjoy your time on the library board. Uh, I don't think we have to vote to accept the resignation of Jonathan Edwards from the Recreation Committee and Community Preservation Committee, but note that we have received his two letters of resignation. Uh, and thank him for his work so far. And thank you for yep. your work on these committees. Uh, we have a request to appoint Chris Williams to the Community Preservation Committee as the representative. See, representative of the Recreation Committee. Is there a or um, so that one's Sanderson, who's the chair of the, the CPC, stopped by and we had a conversation. And the way that the, the bylaws were written is that it's a it needs to be a resident with um, an interest in parks and recreation, is the way that the bylaw reads. And in the Alan had to ask that Chris Williams be appointed. Okay. And Chris has experience with the on the recreation committee. So um, any questions, comments? No. Julie, do you want to move this? Yes. I move that we appro um, approve uh, Chris Williams for the Oh, shoot, remind me the committee. I'm sorry. Community because preservation. Maybe. Community preservation. I second. All in favor, Julie. Yes. Me, yes. Select board liaison updates. Joyce, anything? Uh, I don't have anything okay. to report now. Julie, anything? 
Um, I attended via Zoom the most recent meeting of the water department and got information from them about their plans to update the water rates, uh, which I have not had a chance to review yet since I was going on vacation, but I will review them upon my return and share that information later. And, and all that I have is another meeting of the SCIMS Board of Oversight, where we continue to discuss uh, issues regarding out of district call and essentially working with the new chief to get up to speed and make sure everything is the transition from the old chief to the new interim chief is smooth, but that's those were essentially the issues discussed. <clears throat> uh, town administrator updates. Um, so, um, Mon it was Monday this week? Or was it last week? When was the America the Beautiful Grant? Last week. Last week. Holy cow, last week. <laughs> um, <laughs> we received a call from Mass Fish and Wildlife, and they want to um, include the uh, Christian Lane culvert. Uh, there's not a good ending to this, but um, I don't want to get anybody hope, anybody's hopes up. Um, uh, in a in a larger grant um, to um, uh, National Fish and Wildlife or National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, as part of a larger grant that focused on um, the Mill River watershed in um, in Waitley, um, and uh, so we hurried up and you know tried to get our uh, construction cost estimates and design estimates and everything. We sent them over to them, um, and I think they were kind of shocked by the. I think they got. I think they had sticker shock essentially from you know the the proposed costs of the. Of the culvert, which is anywhere between eight hundred thousand and one point one million, that's you know today's dollars too, um, and their whole grant was I think five million, so it took up about one fifth of of their total allocation. So um, they they sort of backed out, backed away from their commitment to us, uh, but um, we still submitted a letter of support and and. We, we said that we would participate in any of the, the planning activities that they were going to be focusing on within the within the Mill River watershed because um, maybe maybe it will lead to you know opportunities either for some source of funding for the the Christian Lane culvert or the Christian Lane bridge. Um, so we're I was all excited you know Sylvia and I were all excited on Monday and then by the end of the week it was like womp womp <laughs> um, a whole not a whole nothing burger so. Um, but I, I shouldn't say that a smaller burger, put it that way, right? Um, okay, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can yeah. we, whoever's controlling the screen, can we take down the uh, solid waste management, uh, um, yeah. thing? Oh, that's um, exciting. We... That's me. That's yeah. me. <laughs> okay. Good. I can see you so much better now. <laughs> um, town hall window issue. Um, I did have a chance to talk with town council about that, uh, about the issue, and they reviewed the, uh, you know, the limited warranty for the retailer. And um, his suggestion was that we 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 try to work with the manufacturer, which is True Light, to try to um, have them continue to investigate what's going on with the windows. Um, he didn't think that there was much we could do, uh, not do, but they didn't think there was much redress that we could have from. The actual third-party retailer, but um, but if, if True Light is willing to investigate in a in a friendly way, then that's that's the path we should continue to go down to try to see if there's a workable solution um, to address the 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 pink whatever we want to call it splotching on the you know on, on the town hall windows. Um, I'm going to skip over the shared streets and spaces grant. Maybe so we could talk a little bit about 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 that um, paintable road reconstruction project. The the uh, the most recent tip, uh, Pinker County tip, uh, the paintable road project uh, stayed in uh, stayed in its place for anticipated construction in fiscal year 2026. 
So that schedule has not changed um, from when it changed previously, but um, so that's good. Um, center school reuse. Um, uh, Donna Wiley, the historical commission chair, has um, has sent off the historic preservation restriction to Mass Historic. Uh, Mass Historic Commission was looked over and provided comments. And our next step would be to send um, that edited marked up version to town council uh, to review it. And then once we have um, town council's comments back, then that, that would be at a point where we would, we would um, send out the RFP if that was still what the board wanted to do to, to find a buyer for the building. Um, our Hurley Park Accessibility Project, um, that has uh, the main parts of that have wrapped up in terms of the restroom uh, restroom improvements and the paving. We still need to do some line painting in the parking lot, clean up around the edges of the parking lot, wall and seat, and do some final grading. Um, and then there's some plant things that also need to be done. Um, and the Rec Commission has put in a, a CPA application um, to replace a lot of the split rail fence that is between the parking lot and uh, uh, the brook and the drop the, the drop off there uh, down to the brook. Um, so that's going through the works there. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say was um, our neighbors in Deerfield and Conway um, had significant flooding events. Um, last weekend, really last weekend to last weekend, um, Whitley fared uh, significantly better, but we didn't escape everything. Um, we did have a culvert washout on Williamsburg Road. Um, it's the uppermost culvert past the, the two bridges that were recently replaced, well, recently within the past five years replaced. Um, so that has washed out. We have steel plates over the road, um, but it's going to need to be uh, addressed at the short term. Um, key sense is that the culvert, the, the, the culvert, the, the pipe is just so old that backfilling isn't really the greatest option at this point. Um, and it probably needs a, a, a full replacement. Um, so that's what he's, he's, he reached out to uh, Scott Jackson of the Conservation Commission to see what the process for that would be. Um, so, um, we should be getting a report on that at our next meeting or one of our next couple of meetings then. Yeah. Yep. Um, and um, uh, Julie, I, I worked with Wayne today to uh, push forward the water rate uh, and fee process. Um, they have scheduled um, a, a public hearing for okay. August 9th okay. at 5 o'clock. Um, so that will be scheduled and um, I'll send you a copy of the most recent rates and fees schedule that they have. Um, I did some reformatting and a uh, little Wayne and, I, Wayne and I worked on a little bit of clarifications to make sure that a lay person like me could understand um, what's being proposed. So um, I'll send that along. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, do you want to talk about the shared streets and spaces, the bike maintenance sure. stations? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sylvie. Um, I look forward to meeting you in person at some point. Um, Welcome, Sylvie. Thank yeah. you. Nice to be here. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just as a, a reminder, I don't know when the last time you uh, uh, talked about this uh, grant, but so the shared <laughs> streets grant, um, we are planning to install uh, bicycle maintenance stations at um, some different locations in town. Um, and we have a grant that is um, for uh, about 10000 um, and I've been gathering some new quotes uh, from some different uh, companies that provide the equipment. Um, and all of the quotes are in the range of, I would say, 8,500 to uh, 9,800 or thereabouts. Um, I uh, am partial to uh, one product that is um, in the higher end of that range um, and can tell you more about that if somebody you're interested. Um, but uh, I have several quotes, four or five. Um, and so my understanding is that the 
locations. Uh, we have are for the library, the public safety complex uh, here at um, our office complex, um, and um, one at Hurley Park. And I think that those have all been confirmed and, and agreed on. And then there's a fifth location that was talked about in the planning, which I think is for an intersection, I want to say at Holt um, or maybe Holly, but I, I can't quite remember the street intersection. Um, but I don't think that that one was confirmed. So that's something I had the question about. Um, and then I guess, um, so I talked to Keith and I think the installation should be fairly straightforward. Um, and we have until the end of the year, but certainly we would like to um, have, I would like to have the, the equipment ordered so that it can be installed before we start getting to the colder weather, because so that would be more tricky um, for them to do that work at that time. Um, the uh, grant is reimbursement based, so um, we would be purchasing the equipment and then however much we spend on the equipment, um, I'll submit those costs and we would be reimbursed through the grant program. Um, so I guess one question uh, I had that maybe you all could give me your input on was, um, uh, are we, um, should I look toward uh, making sure that we have five stations and then confirm that fifth station? Is there any um, uh, opinion as to whether if uh, once our equipment is somehow favorable but more expensive, if we would want to sacrifice uh, one of the stations for that? Um, and just your thoughts or feelings about that would be helpful as I finalize things. If, if I remember correctly, we had talked about West Waitley Chapel or somewhere in that vicinity as as a location. Do we have an agreement? I guess the church owns the property. I don't believe there was an, an agreement. But I think that would be a, I think a, a good yeah. location for bicycle station, given the number of people who ride up there and come down. Yeah. The rest of the Living on that road, I can confirm a lot of bike riders go up that way. If we, I wouldn't imagine that the church would have a problem with that, but we should, I would like to see if we can get an agreement with them to to put something there. Yeah, Sylvie, can you remind us, like, what is one of what is involved with one of these stations? It's like an air pump or tools. Yeah, um, it's got it's um it's a got somewhere where you can um, hang a bicycle so that the wheels can spin freely and you can do uh, various types of maintenance. And they usually have a set of the most utilized tools that are um, tethered to the pole. Um, the elevates the bicycle, um, so you can do um, various um, changes or tune-ups, yeah. and then also the ones I'm looking at do have an integrated air pump. Okay. Cool. Do we have any locations um, on Mountain Street or Haydenville Road? Because I see a lot of biking there, too. Yeah. I don't, uh, the closest, I think, was the library. I think that was the closest one. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess on the four versus five question, um, well, if we get, if we have, I think whether we have four or five, the main thing is that the eight, the, we, we need something that's going to be sturdy and robust and it's going to last. You know, it's going to, not going to get, you know, not, it's not going to get knocked over by the first person who tries to put their bike on it. Um, yeah, or even or even the 10th or even the 50th. Um, we really, I think we want something that's going to last. And um, I think that's probably more important than the the absolute number. I think the locations are spread out enough when we're talking about Hur Hurley Park and Center of Town and maybe there's one in West Whateley as well, but there's certainly the, the locations are are good. So um I I guess I would be willing to sacrifice one if that meant that we could get equipment that was really gonna last and that we knew that. Not just it's more expensive, so I think it's gonna last. Right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I have seen um, uh, the model uh, that I was looking toward in person, um, and they all are quite um, durable. Uh, all the models that um, are popular on the market, they're um, they're meant to maintain and sustain a lot of use. Um, um, the other thing is that if we did go with fewer stations, um, there might be um, there might be some funds uh, to purchase some additional replacement parts that tend to be replacing after like the five year mark approximately. Um, so that might be worthwhile oh. as well. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, should we discuss if we want we've got five locations, if we want to cut it back to four to get yeah, to save money that way, which would be the location that we would cut from the from our current roster. Hmm. I would I think probably this building is may well be the least utilized route bicycle route of what we've got. I think River Road, Christian Lane, Chestnut Plain, and a West Waitley location. Yeah, Paytonville, Weber, Conway Road up that way. I, 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 I just think that this, this anything at this building would be the least utilized. I would agree, you, and it's also close enough to Hurley Park in a way that it's almost repetitive in that area. Sort of kind yeah, of. I, uh, I, I just don't think that uh, Long Plain is used as much by long haul bike riders as the others. Right. I did also just to mention, reach out to uh, a contact um, with a grant just to check if there was any issue um, with changing the number that we originally proposed in um, our application. Um, so if it comes back that that is a problem, I'll let you know. But um, I'm assuming because it's reimbursement based that um, it shouldn't be problematic. And at least we'll have the option to sort of think about. What are the approximate costs of the, the range of costs of the units we're talking about? Um, for one unit, um, well, so all the quotes that I got were for for five units, okay. um, and uh, that was for um, the air pumps are an additional cost, um, and I can't quite remember what that piece mm -hmm. usually costs per unit, um, but all of the uh, Five unit quotes that I got were in the range of eighty. Uh, I think it was 80, 85 to ninety-eight. Okay, so with the air pumps or without? With air pumps. With the, the okay. Yeah. So that would be everything. So, so there's money in the grant for for five locations. Yes. Um, okay. With with the air pump mm -hmm. oh, for the okay. units for the units that you seem to think are preferable. Um, yeah, uh, the the ones that um, the the ones that I think it, it would be best um, based on what I've seen so far, and also based on preference. Like I, I felt like there's a slight difference between one, between ones that um, I was concerned that ones that have an interior mechanism where the tools are like retractable might be might be problematic, might um, have more moving parts, and therefore have more failure points. Um, and then there are some some ones that have fully the tools fully exposed, which also seems like it might be problematic. There's one unit that's um seems like it'd be um unintrusive and it looks well to put together. That's the more expensive unit, which um I was considering. Um and so but uh certainly I can um you know give you more information on all of them if you if you want to weigh in on that. Um but yeah, the more expensive unit, I think it would put us slightly over if we were to do five units. So I just uh, wanted to find out, you know, if that was, uh, if there was a willingness to. Okay, well, if you, if you can come back to the next meeting, I think we need to have at least an understanding with the church as far as use and installing something at West Waitley Chapel. Okay. And then just sort of harder, you know. If it's going to go over with five units, how much over are we talking about? 
Sylvie, um, in determining locations, are we talking at all with local bike clubs or folks who would have a more knowledgeable, would be more knowledgeable about what are, consi are consistently used bike routes other than us just guessing? Um, well, I have not. Um, I sort of, I came into this uh, midway through the project where um, the, the, the locations had already, uh, as far as I can tell, been selected. So I'm assuming that some of that may have gone on in the past, but I wasn't privy to that part of the process. Okay. Um, yep. Certainly something I can revisit if you like, but um, I was, um, uh, I, I felt like the location seemed logical as far as I can tell. Um, except that one, the the one, the intersection one that I just uh, don't have a um, quite good idea about where and what the sort of location looks like. I need to go over there and check it out. But um, so yeah, if that's something that we want to revisit. I can certainly do that. Um, but I would if it's easy enough, I'd be curious to have you just do a little digging and find out how the decisions were made, just so we know that we're not spending money on things that folks on bikes are going to be going. What did they do that for? <laughs> yeah. Is there any, have you given any thought to any monetary allocation for signage to make sure that people know that you know, when they go back, they know that they're there? Um, I, um, there are options um, for signage. I hadn't given it too much thought, um, primarily, I guess, because the ones that I've seen haven't had a whole lot of signage. I um, uh, Usually there's something on the uh, the station itself. Um, there'll be uh, some sort of picture or, um, you yeah, know, just a, a bike maintenance station. Yeah, I think on there. one of the library in particular is just going to be sort of up the hill, mm -hmm. off the road to make sure people Okay. From out of town coming down, I, I don't know where we would put the sign, but there, mm -hmm. I think there should be some sort of signage to alert mm -hmm. out of town riders that okay. there like is a bike station. The road, yeah. sort of, um, if it's away from the maintenance station, where the maintenance station would be, would, you know, is separate from where they're traveling, like something to direct. Yeah, I, I think bicyclists figure these things out. I mean, they know each other. They yeah, I, I I don't know if there's a special Google app for it. That's but, what uh, I was wondering. Put it on Google Apps, or if there's a bike <laughs> app that folks use. Yeah, we should find out what's the most effective way. Because I, like you, I I I notice them occasionally, and there's not signs, but they get used mm -hmm. all the time. Um, I've seen so, at least one company that. Uh, that provides it maintenance stations that has uh, their own map of where these things are located, but I'm sure there are more local ones too. Um, I, but I'll try, I'll ask some. some okay, questions. yeah, just see if signage is necessary and so what it would take to, okay. to show the location of these. Thank you. Any other comments on this? Any items not anticipated? Um, do we have our meetings scheduled for um, August? August 8th and August 29th. Okay. All right. Are our next schedule. Yeah, that's good. You, you've missed the two weeks when I won't have internet. Great. <laughs> and actually, I'll be there for the 29th. I might even be sworn in. Who knows? Okay. Well, I, I would hope if you're here at that point, you'd be sworn in. <laughs> so. uh, okay, I will move to adjourn. I second. Favor, Julie. Yes. Me, yes. Done. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Well, welcome, welcome, Jessica. Welcome, Sylvie.